Hey, thank you so much for stopping by our Squad YouTube channel. I'm Josh. I'm our youth pastor here at Squad. Squad is our youth group at Cross Point Church, and I wanted to first of all invite you to Squad Wednesday nights at 6:30 here at Cross Point Church. Again, thank you so much for stopping by. We hope that you enjoy this week's message from Squad at Cross Point Church. our worship team for sure all right if you're joining us we're in part four of a series called what was it like in which we're essentially looking at jesus through the eyes of one of his best friends uh john and if you're using your eyes right now you probably can't see me because there's a lot of smoke up here but it's all cool there's not a fire it's just for the effects but uh thank you guys uh can we also give a big hand for our uh volunteers in the back genesis jante jacob Joel on the sound, getting stuff done. More to come at the end of tonight's uh, message if you would like to help us out in that aspect. But back to the message. Um, so we're in this series called What Was It Like? And we're looking at Jesus' life through his best friend because his best friend John wrote down some things that happened to Jesus. And uh, specifically last week we talked about this. John had a purpose for what he wrote, and it was so that people would believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So he gave the facts, the details, so it would all point to say, Fact check me, who else could it be? Here are seven things that he did that point to him being the Messiah. We've talked about some of them, but just to catch you up, if, uh, if you're wondering, like, what are the seven signs that Jesus performed? Uh, here they go. Uh, water into wine. We just saw, talked about new wine. It wasn't so they could turn up at a party. There was a metaphor behind it. And like we mentioned, that if you drank some of the water back then, you may not um, have a great night. You'd be sick the rest of the day. Uh, so that was also part of that. But moving on, that was Jesus's first sign. I don't think you can turn water into wine, Uh, but he did. So John was like, who else could do that? The second sign he did was uh, he healed an official son, which was ironic and weird because if you were an official, you shouldn't be advocating for this guy that people thought was trying to take over the government. And he comes up to Jesus, falls at his feet and says, hey, can you help me out? And Jesus with one word like words uh, heals his son. So that was pretty cool. He moves on from there. And then uh, what we talked about a little bit last week, he healed a man that was paralyzed, but it was on the Sabbath, and he wasn't supposed to do that, but he healed a guy that couldn't walk, let him walk. Uh, After that, he fed 5,000 people with a Happy Meal, for sure, yep, kept the toy, and he uh, he was able to do that. Then he walked on water. That was was pretty miraculous. That was was interesting. And today we're going to talk about a time that he healed a blind man, okay? And then the seventh sign that uh, John talks about, if you're just curious and need to know in case you're ever in a trivia contest, it is that he raised Lazarus from the dead, which we'll talk about on a later date. But let's go back to that. He healed a blind man. So today's title, if you're taking notes or need something to tweet, or I'm sorry, my fault, Snapchat or Instagram, I'm talking to my generation. Uh, If you're watching on YouTube and you need something to tweet, then you can tweet this. Uh, The title is, What Was It Like to See Jesus? What was it like to see Jesus? So with that being said, let's jump into uh, the context of our story. Jesus heals a man that is blind. We're going to be speaking uh, from John chapter 9. It'll be on the screen for you if you didn't bring a Bible. Uh, But John chapter 9, and I'm going to skip around and summarize because it's kind of a long story, and I want to compare it to something and give you some teachable moments when you read Scripture. But here we go. Uh, Three verses right here. Check this out. So Jesus just got done with an argument with the Pharisees. He's leaving the temple. And then John writes this. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, which we would all probably wonder this question because you've wondered it when bad things happen. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What you have to know is this culture back then, they thought that if something bad happened to you or you were born with an ailment, or some sort of disformity, that it was because you sinned or your parents sinned and God was punishing you. And so you may have thought that, like, why do bad things happen to bad people? Well, because they're bad. Well, not necessarily. Sometimes things just happen, all right? And here's how we know that, because Jesus goes on to clarify in the next verse. Verse 3, he says this, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. If you have a smartphone and want to take a picture of something, that would be a great thing to take a picture of. Or just remember John 9 and 3. We're going to come back to it a little bit later. 
But Jesus said, this happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Here's what that means. Sin isn't just tied to suffering. Like you may have wondered, like if something bad happened to you, God, are you punishing me for something? And that's not always the case. Now, don't get me wrong. You may behave your way into consequences. Like when you disobeyed your parents, they punished you. That's not necessarily like God saying, oh, I, I hate you. That's saying you broke your parents' rule. They, they love you, and that's why they're doing that. But what I'm trying to say is Jesus in this verse is saying sin isn't always tied to suffering. In other words, there may be a purpose for your pain. And that's not always good to like swallow when you're going through something difficult. That's not always good to hear when you're going through a trying time. But Jesus is looking at his disciples talking about this blind guy and saying, no, he's blind so that God could be put on display, which would be weird. But thankfully, John kept writing. And so here's what you uh, need to know if you're, if you're taking notes and you need something else to write down. The first thing I want you to know is that sin and suffering aren't always connected, and there may be a purpose behind the pain. The other thing you need to consider is how Jesus heals this guy. This is about to be disgusting, so please don't try this at home. Don't do this to your sibling again, because you've probably already done it, let's be honest. But here's what Jesus does. I'm going to summarize it for you, but you can read about it, because John tells us. At this point, Jesus, imagine that you're the blind guy. You're just sitting there. You're hearing this conversation. You're probably annoyed that someone else or a group of other people are talking about you again. And then you hear this sound. And it's at that point you wonder, what is going on? Jesus spat on the ground, made mud, and put it on this guy's eyes. So if he couldn't see before, now he's really in a world of hurt. Like now he's got like sand in his eyes. I don't know if you've ever had sand in your eyes. Very uncomfortable. If I get a hair in my eye, the world ends, right? But he is sitting there. He's now got, he, he was minding his own business. Imagine you're just minding your own business. You hear a whoosh, And then, whoosh, you're right? And it, I'm sure that like the disciples are like, Jesus, what? that's a felony. And it, 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 it's a felony today. So don't spit on people. So he just put his spit and dirt on this guy who was minding his own business didn't know Jesus, wasn't in a conversation with Jesus, and Jesus just, like, gives this man a mud pie. And then he says this, now go. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I feel like I want to fight you. If I could just picture where you are right now, like, keep talking. I'm going to narrow you down, right? And I'm going to Liam Neeson style or something. And he spits on him, or spits on the ground, puts some mud on his eyes, and then says, go and wash. Well, well yeah, now I've got to wash. Uh, it, it smells bad, right? And so he's now got to go wash. But when he did, as he was washing away each particle of dirt, he began to see colors, shapes, light, and he could see. And he goes home, and his neighbors say, hola, hola, hola. He's not feeling his way around. He didn't bump into that, that limb. He, Dude, weren't you just begging? Aren't you the guy that can't see? And then it started a conversation where other people were wondering, like, is this the guy that can't see? And then it led to a further conversation and an argument. But I want to take a quick time out and do a flashback. So if we're watching a TV show, this would be the part where, like, the screen waves, right? And we go back to another time. You may be familiar with another time that Jesus healed a blind man. So this time, if, if you brought a Bible, it's in Mark 10. It'll be on the screen for you here in a second. Let me set that up. This time, the blind guy is just sitting down near the road, and he hears a commotion, and, he's, and he says, hey, I, I picture it like it's Ray Charles. Who's that? You know, he's got some sunshades on, some Ray-Bans. I'm going to let it do what it do, baby. You know, he's sitting there, like, asking for money. He, he, he's, he's begging, but he hears a commotion, and he says, who, who is that? And the people around him say, oh, it's Jesus. Him and his crew are coming through. And next thing you know, he starts yelling, Jesus! Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he gets loud, and then the people around him are embarrassed at this point because they're just sitting there, like, what, kind of watching the parade, watching Jesus. Oh, there's Jesus, okay. I thought he was taller. I thought he was shorter. I thought his beard was a little thicker than that. You know, whatever the case may be. And he starts yelling, so then the, a lot of attention's coming this way. They turn to him and say, dude, would you shut up? Would you be quiet? Calm down. Stop talking. 
and he got louder and louder because when you're desperate for a miracle and a breakthrough, you don't care what people think of you. So sometimes you're going to come to church. You may be the one that's like just emotional, an emotional wreck because of what's going on in your life, and you just don't care anymore because you need some help. You need some assistance. It's an emergency, and that's how this guy felt. So he screams out, Jesus, Jesus, and then finally Jesus stops and says, who is that? Call him here. And they kind of pick at him and say, come on, man, it worked. Get up, get up, shut up, stop saying stuff. He wants you, go up there. So this guy goes up to the front, and Jesus asks him this, and here's a conversation. Mark tells us this in uh, chapter 10, verse 51. He said, what do you want me to do for you? And the guy responds, Rabbi, which just means teacher. Rabbi, I want to see. I want to do something I've never done before. I, I want to, to be able to picture the sounds that uh, pass by me time after time. Jesus, I've never been able to have a job. I can't make money, so I've got to beg for it because I can't see. I want to see. And Jesus gave a similar directive, but not the same one to this guy. Now, this guy's name was Bartimaeus. He said, go. But he didn't tell him to go wash. He just said, go. Your faith has healed you. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Same miracle, two different people, two different methods. And here's why I wanted to point those, those pictures out to you of how Jesus did it totally different. Don't get attached to a procedure. God wants you to experience a process. What I mean by that is that there's a difference between a process and a procedure. You may have heard how someone else got a breakthrough, how like your friend's parents, they were at the brink of a divorce and they like started going to church because like your friend prayed for them. And next thing you know, they like redid their vows and everything and, and their marriage is stronger. Uh, you prayed that your family member would stop being sick and, and you tried to do the same thing that a friend did and it didn't work out for you. You didn't get that same breakthrough by doing all the same steps that your friend did. And you're wondering, God, is it, is it that I've sinned? Is it that you're punishing me or you don't care about me? I'm doing the same thing that they did. And I just want to tell you, squad, it's not about the procedure. A procedure is steps that you would follow to get an outcome. Like when you read the back of a, of a microwavable macaroni and cheese, step one, remove the plastic label. Step two, add this much water. Step three, microwave for three minutes. No, it says three and a half. No, three minutes because I don't have time to wait for it to cool down, right? So I'm following all these steps so that it's going to end up looking like the picture. That's not faith. That's not a relationship with God. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, pray. Yes, fast. Yes, do these things because they do happen they, or they do work. They can help. But don't just think that you can do these checkbox things and then God's going to show up in, like a genie in a bottle. He wants the process. Why does he want the process? Why would he still allow me to go through this when I did the steps? Because maybe he wants God to be put on display in that situation. So it's a process. So I wanted to make sure that you knew that God may do it different for you. The same way that he's going to do it different for a friend that you know. But we have a different process, but one God. So let's go back to our example. We have one guy who knew Jesus, right? The, the, the Ray-Bans. You're right, I'm going to let it do what it do, baby, on the side of the street. We have him who knew Jesus, called out Jesus, called out Jesus' background family tree, like Ancestry.com, saying, son of David, right? I know everything about you. Come help me. He called him out. But the other guy that got mud into the face, like the mud pie dude and John, he didn't know Jesus. He, he was just in the right place at the right time, didn't ask Jesus anything, and got slapped with some dirt, Okay. Two different processes, but the same result or outcome. I like your word better, Davis. Yeah, Diff the same outcome. So here's what I want you to take from that, squad. You can please research this, Google this for years to come. This is something that's just like my summary, and I've dumbed it down because, guys, I pictured this way. I'm not a smart guy, so I've got to dumb it down so I can understand it. And so I just want to present to you in my mind what faith is looks like for each and every person. So if you've ever wondered, like, what exactly is faith? I don't understand. Like Hebrews, uh, they talk about in there, I think Hebrews chapter 11, boom, you can look it up. But here's the formula for faith 
in my mind, you can adopt this if you want to. I beg you to research it and find out for yourself. But in my mind, in my experience, I took this crazy apologetics class while I was trying to get my master's right now. And apologetics doesn't mean that I'm becoming better at saying I'm sorry. It means I defend my faith. All right. So when I give an apology for my faith, I'm not saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian. It's I'm defending why I'm a Christian and how the facts line up with history and science and worldview and that, that kind of thing. Okay. Probably too much for you guys. But anyway, here's my formula for what faith is. All right. It's going to be on the screen for you. So in my mind, faith is a combination of explanation or reason, reasoning, like talking about details, facts. Um, so I want to know like my science book and this part of the scripture actually line up and that, that makes sense all of a sudden. Uh, it might be that, well, I read that fire fell down from heaven. I need reasoning behind that. How could that possibly happen? Well, if you go to Southern California during certain months of the year, they have natural forest fires. That's a really big deal. That can happen. Well, I don't know about this whole flood thing or maybe the how they walked across the Red Sea. Well, during a tsunami, sometimes the water gets pulled back and it creates like a wall barrier of water and you can walk across it if you go drive around Fayetteville now because dams are broken where it used to be water, it's now dry land. So yeah, there's some reasoning there and I love discussions like this. So some people need more of an explanation or a reason for their faith. And then other people have just too much experience. Like they have experienced some things, seen some things and heard some things. Like, you know, who you, are. you went to the church that lasted for three hours and everybody would fall out by the end of the service, right? You, maybe you were a volunteer catcher for somebody. Some of y'all are like, I don't know what he's talking about. Not you, right? You, this wouldn't be you. But some of you, you, like you were a catcher or maybe you were one of the ones who said, I don't believe in that whole falling out thing. And then one time, apostle mm, came by and like just touched you and grazed. The next thing you know, you woke up looking at the life saying, what happened, right? So you've experienced some things. Maybe you've seen an exorcism. Maybe you've been exercised upon. I don't, I don't know. But you have experienced some things. So it would be very difficult for someone to come up to you and say, oh, faith isn't real, because and try to give you facts. And you can say, nah, bro, I have seen some things. So in my mind, faith is a combination where you have reasoning and explanation, and then you have things that you've experienced. And it's different for each of us. Some of us need more reasoning, more explanation. Others of us, no, nah, I've got plenty of ex experience to explain away a bunch of stuff, and it just fluctuates. So this is the portrait I see between blind Bartimaeus, uh, Bartimaeus, who's over here, and he already knew Jesus. And I, I think because of that, he already had strong faith because he knew what Jesus could do, and, and Jesus said, your faith has saved you. So he already had the highlight. He didn't need reasoning. He didn't need Jesus to explain away like, hey, scientifically, I'm about to make your, uh, your iris come back and pop into color, or looking at the pressure of your eyeball, we just need to do this surgery right here. He just knew it could happen. Meanwhile, back in John, we got this other dude who's just in the right place at the right time, and he would probably, probably need more reasoning and explanation. But they had the same experience at the end of the day. So with that being said, I want to look at how the story ends. Because I think some of us in the room, maybe you haven't had a relationship with God. Maybe you just, you come on Wednesday nights because the person that brings you is awfully cute, right? Let's be real. And so you're, you're the John version. Now, some of you, like you, the one that fell out, you know, five years ago at summer camp, you over there said, Jesus, right? You, 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 you full of experience, you know, Jesus, you, you and Jesus have been in a relationship since the beginning of time, and I mean like his time, like years before you were even born, like you just, you know Jesus like that, okay? He followed you back on Instagram, like it's, you're close, okay? So you might be in the room too, but I think you can help. I think you can help someone's faith because some of the explana explaining that they need, you can't give them, but you can help. Well, Josh, how am I going to do that if they need explanation and all I've got is experience? You can be like the the guy that we're about to read about, in John. So what happened after he wiped the mud out of his eyes and he goes home? He got questioned because the Pharisees wanted to know, how did you go from being blind to seeing again? And he gets into this conversation, and they don't believe him. So they do what anyone else would do. They called his parents in, and they asked him a series of questions. Question number one. 
Is this your son? Yeah. Yeah, that's him. Was he born blind? Yes. Yes, he was. Can he now see? Son, how many fingers am I holding up? Yeah, yeah, he, he's good. He's good. 2020, 2020, right? So now all of a sudden, they're, they're questioning the parents, and they say, well, how did he become able to see? And they said, I don't know. Ask him. Best part of Scripture. We're going to skip over the verse, but best part of Scripture in this story is right here. They look at the guy. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, imagine, like I'm trying to, like blinking contest. I'm trying, are you really able to, like I'm probably doing some of this, like testing to see, like can you actually see? Is this a joke? And they say, so you can see. Yeah. How can you see? This guy came by, spit on the ground, put mud on my face, and then I wash it off. Who is he and where did he go? I don't know. I was blind. I had mud on my eyes. I don't know which way he went. He could have been, went that way. Or, I don't, both ways. Look around, man. I'm new to this whole thing, right? And they're asking for evidence. He's like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if his saliva had certain molecules in it because of what he ate or what he drank. Maybe the fish that he had a few days ago, maybe it just saturated into the soil that he so happened to put into my eyes, created some sort of sedimentary molecule combination that released the blockage of glaucoma. Over, I don't know. I don't know. So they wanted reason. They wanted explanation. And this guy who had zero faith, really, is what I would say, but he didn't have faith in Jesus. He didn't know what to say. And isn't it true that when you try to tell your friends about Jesus and why you come to squat every Wednesday and why they should too, it's like, I don't quite know how to describe it. Well, take this guy's example and see what you could do with it. Here's what he said in verse 25 in John chapter 9. He replied, because they asked him, is this guy a sinner? Is he for real? Like, tell us the truth. Tell us the truth. Praise God. Glorify God by telling us what really happened. They're trying to catch him saying this is all the trick. And here's what the guy says. Whether he is a sinner or not, I, I don't know that. I don't even know who the guy is. One thing I know, the one thing I do know, the one thing that I'm confident in is that I was blind and now I see. That's all I know from today's example of whatever happened here. I, I don't know. I don't really know exactly where I was standing. I see some, some mud missing from over there. I see the pool over there where I washed. All I know is this morning I woke up, I could not see, bumping into everything. And right now, I can see you clear as day. That's all I know. So sometimes you just have to explain to your friends, I don't know. But I know that my parents went through a tough time. There's arguing every day. And I could find joy when I got closer to God. That's all I know. I, I, I don't know how cancer works, but I prayed I fasted, I sought God, I asked him why, and I felt a sense of peace as I watched my family member with so much joy still praising God as they battled that disease. That's all I know. And from that conversation, they got so upset with this guy, they kicked him out of the synagogue. That was his first like church experience, like, hey, I can see everything now, I can see the people. And they kicked him out because they thought he was lying can't be true. And wouldn't you know, Jesus happened to be nearby. And they concluded this conversation. They concluded this man's day. They concluded this man's story. And John wrote it down. And I think it will help us in our journey of faith. Here's what happened between Jesus and this blind guy. Chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, so he sought after him. Jesus came for him just like he comes for us. He sought after him, and he asked him this, do you believe in the Son of Man? <laughs> so, so get this, he just healed the guy. The first question he asked him is, do you believe in the Son of Man? It's a random question. That, go ask anyone, that the first person you see when you leave this building, go ask, do you believe in the Son of Man? Random thing to start off with. But he asked him that, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the guy responds, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Because here's what I do know. 
He didn't know what Jesus looked like, but he probably remembered what he sounded like. And when he heard that voice, not followed by, he realized, this is, this is the guy. This, this is him. And so he's saying, hey, if you believe him, and after what you did for me, I'm on that juice. Give me some more of that, right? And he says, hey, tell me so that I will believe. And Jesus follows it up this way. Jesus said, you have now seen him because you already heard me. You already know my voice. That's still a small thing in the back of your mind whenever you're about to make a decision, whenever you're panicking, whenever you have anxiety and worry. That's still a small voice that says, it's going to be okay. He said, but now you can see me. So you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one talking to you. And then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. He went from zero faith to worship because of an experience. So from that conversation and what this man went through and what the other man went through, they ended in the same result, that both men followed Jesus because of what happened to them. So sometimes pain can serve a purpose so that you can be, or so that you can have Jesus revealed to you. Just like that verse said in the beginning when Jesus said, it's so that God can be put on display. That's why. And then it happened. But don't take my word for it. Look what happens following that. So this man believed Jesus was not done because he had to tell another group of people off. Check out savage Jesus right here. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. So that the blind, the God that he healed, could now see and the Pharisees that he was just talking to that don't believe that he is the son of God would be blind to everything he had done. Verse 40 says, some Pharisees who were with him heard him say, they heard him say that and asked, what? Are, are you saying that we're blind too? Oh no, oh no, you didn't just come after me right now. I'm a religious leader. I'm a Pharisee. And Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of your sin. If you didn't know you were sinning, if you didn't prescribe to, to know God and be in a relationship with God, then yeah, I can't hold you guilty for sin. But when you try to say that, yeah, I'm a Christian, that yeah, I follow God, that I believe in him, then I can hold you guilty. But now that you claim that you can see, then yeah, your guilt remains. So you're blind to who God is. So here's how I want to summarize that for, for us tonight, squad. John wrote this down to prove that this was the son of God. So if this is true, if that conversation right there between him, this blind man, and this group of Pharisees is all true, then shouldn't it impact the way that we act? If it, if it is absolutely true that he came so that blind people who didn't know who he was could see him, then isn't it true that it should probably impact the way that we see God, see people, and behave toward them? So the main question comes down to, your faith. Bad things happen. And I hate that they happen. I'm sorry that if you're going through something right now with like depression or battle that you're going through, I, I'm so sorry that you're going through that. But I think beginning tonight, you may be going through something or you may eventually go through something so that you can see God. Maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time. But so you can see God on display and what he will do through your life may carry over to impact someone else's life because here's what now can happen. Because of this man's story, I doubt that he'll simply walk by another blind person on the street. I bet if he was in the crowd where blind Bartimaeus was, crying out, screaming, and maybe he was. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. But he was probably sitting beside him if he, if he was saying, if that's Jesus, he can heal you, because he healed me too. I don't know how, I, I can't explain it. All I know is that I was blind, and now I can see. 
So maybe you're not physically blind tonight. But have you seen Jesus lately? And the love of how someone treats you or how you treat someone else or just a miracle that broke through in your, in your house? So I'm thinking tonight can be the time that you begin searching for Jesus. Now I'm running low on time, so I want to just close in a prayer. So if you would, close your eyes, bow your head.